If there's a missing value for latitude or longitude, and it gets turned into a zero at some point, remember these are millions of records, all sorts of little problems get in there. But let's say your latitude just gets replaced by a zero at some point, then that generates this line of points. You see that? Just to give you an illustration, very early in my career I was, I was involved in um, capturing the, the data associated with the bird collection at the Field Museum in Chicago. And as we were going through this, you know, we had technicians who were capturing the data, and they were doing kind of 500 to 1,000 records per person per day. And we really wouldn't allow them to work more than about six hours because nobody can concentrate that much. Um, and these weren't really scientists, but they got very proficient with the data by, you know, after a, a week or a month or a year of work. Um, and so we were very concerned that the right data got put into the right fields. Because you remember those specimen tags we have are small, and the traditions as far as which data, data element went where changed over the years. And so we had a big argument, a big uh, debate about how long it would be before we found a collector named Bill Black, right? William Black. Because what that would really be saying is that the beak of the bird is black. And so we had bets about whether it would be a week or a month or a year before Bill Black showed up as a collector. And indeed, Bill Black did show up as a collector, but he was beaten into the list by Iris Brown, right? Brown <laughs> eyes. <coughs> and so you really have to think when you're dealing with lots and lots and lots of data records, everything that ha can go wrong will go wrong. And in fact, as you guys work with biodiversity data, you can assume that everything that can go wrong has already gone wrong and will continue. So uh, CRIA, which runs Species Link, has created tools for essentially supporting data cleaning. Um, here you can see, I actually blacked out the name of the collection because I didn't want somebody to feel bad with me when I created this, this slide. Um, but this is a, clearly a large collection, 235,000 records. Um, you can see the data are mainly Brazil. Those are probably some of those longitude errors. These could be other types of errors. You can see a uh, missing longitude effect um, I'm guessing that these are some sort of error. So you can see all sorts of problems in there. Well, what CRIA created was this page that kind of gives you a diagnosis of the data set. So first it gives you basic statistics about how many have geographic coordinates, how many don't, uh, how many of them fall in the ocean, okay, which matters for terrestrial organisms, how many catalog numbers are present twice in the data set. Um, how many records, the entire record, are duplicated and are present twice? Uh, or how many name and field number of the collector are repeated in the data set? And those aren't necessarily wrong, but they're probably more likely to be wrong than a record that doesn't repeat something. And so we have all of these little helps, like here are 1,841 suspicious genera, which is, mean, which is to say they don't match a taxonomic authority list. Or uh, the name of the country and state or state might be something non-standard. And so they created these diagnostics where you can not only see the overall snapshot, but you can see it through time. So here's the accumulation of records in that data set. 
And then these are really neat because these are problems. And so you can see you know, suspicious genera get up to 11,000, but then they go down. Why would that happen? They go down because the curator went in and started working on fixing those generic names. Or here, you know, duplicate records. You see there were as many as 12,000 of them. And clearly the curator went in and said, okay, I'm gonna fix these problems, checked each one of them, and now for a long time they've been at zero. So these are tools to help us do this biodiversity informatics mission better. <clears throat> one of the most exciting things we can do is integrate the data. Up till now, everything I've told you about is really something that you could do inside of one institution. Species Link, and you all know of other um, examples, VertNet, GBIF. Um, Species Link currently integrates 251 collections or sub-collections provides access to 5.2 million records. I think it's more like 7 million now, um, of which about half are geo-referenced. And they refer to approximately 390,000 species. And this is what the Species Link Network looks like just within Brazil. The hub is in Campinas in southern Brazil. But all of these collections contribute data to this system. And so at the same time we have the value of a distributed set of, of collections across Brazil, we also have the value of having all the data together in one place. We can go farther by integrating data intelligently, and that's gonna bring us to things like standardized vocabularies, and rich annotations, but essentially things that make the integration process more efficient and more effective. Um, and then I'm going to show you this slide a bunch of times in this course. It's a messy slide. It's a tough one to put together. We had a lot of trouble assembling this slide. But essentially what it's about is the biological which we can, you know, kind of one way of organizing might be genotype, phenotype, interactions amongst phenotype species, um, interactions between the biological world and the environment, and interactions with humans. And we can kind of signal some particular um, dimensions of these biological um, levels of organization, we can think about uh, population ecology, we can talk about biodiversity loss. And then there are things that we can actually measure and characterize like evolutionary history, taxonomy, geographic distributions, um, and then things that we may want to get out like conservation strategies. And a lot of what we're going to be doing in this field, this is one way of kind of organizing a view of this field. At the time we published that paper, I really liked it. And with every year that goes by, I like it less and less. But really, a lot of what we're trying to do is either characterize one thing very richly, or even more importantly and more difficult, integrate amongst. So, you know, what is the evolutionary history of the fauna or flora of Africa? Well, that's integrating these two, okay? And those are the really kind of endpoint sorts of discussions that we can have um, as we go farther and farther into these fields. Or you know, how do we build a conservation strategy that responds at multiple scales to the geographic distributions of all the species that we might be interested in? <coughs> Guess what? We can't do that right now. We might be able to do it for one taxon, or at some scales, very coarse scales, but we can't do it yet. So we can use as a definition, just a working definition, the application of informatics techniques to biodiversity information for improved capture cleaning management 
Improvement, Analysis, and Interpretation. Then this is kind of a, a bit of a commentary about the field. Um, in many senses, what's gone on in biodiversity informatics, let's say over the last 20 years, where the field's really been kind of in existence, my feeling is that a lot of what's happened has been driven by the availability of data and the available technology. And that those have together driven which ideas and which concepts we work on. And that's pretty disturbing. You know, I do what I can, right? I do what's possible. No. We should come in with the ideas and concepts. We should come in with a thinking framework. And that thinking framework should drive the evolution of the data and, and the techniques and tools. So essentially the field has been operating backwards. Okay? And then one last kind of overview of concepts is this idea of biodiversity leaks. Um, up here at the beginning of the chain is all of biodiversity. And most of that is not characterized. We're talking about every species of plant, animal, micro, what have you, across every square meter of the Earth's surface. So most of the world is work left to be done. But some portion of biodiversity has been sampled. Right? The herbariums, the museum collections, the observational data. Some part of biodiversity has been sampled over the years. And if we could plug into that level, we would know a fair amount. Three or four billion specimens in existence in museum collections around the world, and uncounted numbers of observational data. But as we go through this chain, we lose data, okay? For example, some of that sampling has been lost. And of those specimens that haven't been lost, some of them remain unidentified. And of those specimens that have been identified, oops, some of them are not yet digitized. And of the ones that have been digitized, some of them are dirty data, right? Data that are full of errors or simply haven't been checked to see how many errors there are. And even of those data that, are, that exist and that are digital and all of that, some of them haven't been georeferenced. And so we lose even more data. Some of the data haven't been published. Some of the data have been published but in non-standard formats. And many, many of the data haven't been shared and integrated. So the point is, you know, imagine we're trying to provide water to a city and we plug our water into this huge source, <clears throat> but if our piping is full of holes, what arrives at your house at the end is very little. Sometimes even nothing. So this concept is very useful to think about. Sometimes if you plug one leak in this chain here, you may create a huge increase down here. Or sometimes you have the challenge of fixing all of these. And this is just kind of a way of thinking about the chain or the, the, the plumbing system of biodiversity informatics. And then one last point um, is that this actually makes a difference. This is, this is just one measure of uh, information control. This is within Mexico, where I've worked for a quarter century. Um, I can show you several other different measures of information control. But as information increases, the really interesting thing that happens, Mexico in the last 20 years has taken control of its own biodiversity information. It's built bibliographical resources, it's built specimen resources, 
It's going to access to data around the world. This is the proportion of publications. This is about Mexican birds. The proportion of publications on Mexican birds authored by Mexicans. <coughs> and what you see is right about at the change of the millennium, Mexicans are doing the science on Mexican birds. That's a very interesting thing. Rather than somebody in the US or somebody in Europe. Okay? This is a, a country taking uh, control of its, its information future. 